human microbiome and inflammatory bowel disease. As an acronym for inflammatory bowel disease, I would say IBD. Acro means summit or tip. Num means name. So this is a second name from irritable bowel disease, so it is IBD. The human microbiome, what is a human microbiome? It is an aggregate of genomes. So to remember, genome, OME, and microbiome, OME. So it is the gene of the microorganism that exists in us and on us. The specific myoorganism which live with us are called the microbiota. But usually you hear the name used the same, microbiome and microbiota. So now we know microbiome is the genome and microbiota is the organism, organisms which live in us and on us. So the microbiota which live in us, they are 10 times the number of our cells. Our human cell is 37 trillion of cells. So microbiota is 10 times more than our human cells. Genetically, the human genome we carry is 1%, but the microbiome, which is the genome of the microbiota, is 99% in the human body. What is this microbiota? It is an acquired organ which start to develop while we are in utero, inside the uterus of our mums. And how do we know this? Because the fetus inside the uterus it drink the fluid because the fetus is inside the sac and inside the sac, the fetus is swimming. And this fluid is called amniotic fluid. They took sample and they find that there are bacteria in the amniotic fluid. And the fetus swallow the amniotic fluid and they swallow the meconium, which is the feces of the fetus, and then it pass urine again in the amniotic fluid and it pass feces. So the microbiome start to shape while we are inside the womb. The immune system in the fetus start at five weeks old and the cells are produced inside the liver. But at 12 weeks old, the bone marrow of the fetus start to produce cells for the immune system. And the bone marrow is the soft tissue which you find inside the bones. So this microbiome is started in utero and during the birth in the vaginal canal, the baby's head negotiate the vagina to get out into this world. And if you have seen a fetal head negotiating the birth canal, you will understand the most common position for the fetal head to be delivered 
and the small less diameter of the fetal head to go through the birth canal is when the fetal head present in occipital anterior position. The occiput, it is the highest point in the skull. So the baby's head will present with the occiput and the face posing toward the posterior vaginal wall because the head is flexed. And then when the head comes out, there is a lot of secretions on the face, in the nose, on the eyes, in the mouth, on the cheek, and all body. During the fetal head, while it is pressing to get out and to dilate the vaginal opening, the anal canal and the rectum behind the vagina are pressed and the feces come out. Most of the patient in labor, they pass feces. And some of these feces will go on the face of the fetus. What we do, we wipe it when we clean the baby. This microorganism inoculate the baby's nose, the baby's mouth, the baby's ear, the baby's respiratory tract, the baby's gut or digestive tract, and the baby's skin. The most important and the most common site for the microorganism is the digestive tract. That is to say, from the mouth to the anus. And most of these organisms are in the colon. Why? Because the food stay in the colon for 24 hours and it get fermented. Usually the complex carbohydrate, which we cannot digest as a human being because we do not have enough genes to digest complex carbohydrate. We have only 20 genes, but bacteroidetes, which is a phyla in the colon, it has 240 genes. So these bacteria are able to digest the complex carbohydrate and ferment them and produce gas and produce metabolites. So the poo of the microorganism are the metabolites, which are useful for our health and our disease. This microbioma or microbiota which live in the gut are called commensal, meaning they live in symbiosis with us. They are not pathogenic, they are friendly and they are good. They are even more than good. They are essential for our health. So this microbiota, it is an acquired organ, consists of trillions of organisms and produce millions of chemicals. I say million because till now we don't know what they are producing. We know just a little. And what we know is amazing. But this is just the beginning, I think, of a new field in medicine which will be called microbiota medicine or microbioma medicine. Why? Because this microbiota, it is very essential to train the immune system from the early days of life. It modulates the immune system. Those babies who are delivered vaginally and who are fed by breastfeeding, their immune system behave differently from babies who are delivered by cesarean section and given milk formula. 
Why? Because the microbioma of the vagina, it is genetically compatible with the baby because the mother and the baby, they develop tolerance during the pregnancy. The immune system of the mother develop tolerance and accept the baby, although at the beginning, the fetus is considered a foreign body because some of the genome of the fetus are from the sperm and they are foreign to the mother body. Also, during the sperm penetration in the vagina and in the cervix, it might bring with it microorganism and go up and might also go with it into the egg when it fertilized the egg. Although till now we think it is a sterile environment, but after knowing the number of these microorganisms and how they are evolved with us, I don't think, for me, from my brain, I think there is nothing without these microorganisms. Although they believe that it is a sterile. It could be, but there must be some small microorganisms on the ovaries, in the ovarian follicles, and even when the egg is fertilized. This microbiome, I said it is in the eye, although it is very little microbiota in the eye, because the eye, it has a great defensive system against the microorganism. The nose, the mouth, the skin, the gut, the placenta, when the woman was pregnant, the semen, it has microbiome, the breast, the duct, in the breast, the biliary duct of the liver, the ovarian follicles in the ovaries. So these bacteria and organisms, they are all over the place. Their function is to modulate the immune system. Number two, they modulate the nervous system. 90% of the serotonin is produced in the gut, and 50% of the dopamine is produced in the gut. So there is definitely now established that there is gut microbioma brain axis. The microbioma affect the mood, affect how we feel, and depression, fear, and anxiety, schizophrenia, subset of schizophrenia, uh, psychosis, all these mental condition, it is also related to the gut microbiome. Microbiome help in the digestion of the food and produce nutrients which are absorbed, go in the blood, and they are essential for our health and for our physiology. So, the medicine we take, therapeutics, also it is digested by the microbiome of the gut. And how we respond to drugs, it depends on the gut. And there is great work now on patients with cancer and they take chemotherapy how they could make them respond to chemotherapy or to immunotherapy by modulating the microorganism in the gut with the prebiotic and probiotics and symbiotics. There is a lot of research and experiment is done on animals like mice, and also a clinical trial in human. So, the gut microbiome, we said, it is modulating immune system, nervous system, digestion, uh, metabolism of the drug. It is also important 
in bone mass and how the bone are develops because the bone it depend on the absorption of calcium vitamin k2 vitamin d3 and so it is related to the gut microbiome also angiogenesis meaning angio mean blood vessel genesis meaning the new formation genesis genesis mean forming angio mean blood vessel forming in new blood vessels and this is very important in the physiology of the body it help in defending our body against pathogens and this microbiome in number it is 10 times the number of our cell in weight it is about 3 pounds some people say 4 pounds and a kilo is 2.2 pounds in metric it is 1.2 kilograms what are these organisms they are bacteria viruses bacteriophage meaning bacteria infected with the viruses and then the virus kill the bacteria and now it is called bacteriophage bacteria mean bacteria phage meaning bacteria eater and these bacteriophages they have a special shape in a three dimension they have a head they have a tail and the head sometimes if you look at it under the electron microscope about 20 faces round and sometimes it is around sometimes it is without tail sometimes it is elongated these bacteriophages wherever there is bacteria there are bacteriophages and the highest density of virus in the planet is in the ocean these viruses infect the bacteria in the oceans to recycle the organic matter of the bacteria also in our microbiome are the fungi the protozoa worms parasites it is an ecosystem this microbiome it is not there by chance it is in our body since we are in the womb of our mom and as a human being we evolve from the beginning when the earth started we evolve and coexist with the bacteria these microorganisms they are very versatile they are very powerful because of their number is huge and they can adapt to extreme conditions they can live in boiling water they can live in acid like the stomach acid or in the mines they can live in hot temperature cold temperature in a pressure very high pressure in the bottom of the oceans these bacteria they are all over in the environment and these microorganisms we live in a cloud of microorganisms they are in the animals in the plant they are in all living organisms they are in the soil 
there is a microbiome in the soil. A lot of activity in the soil. So now, the microbiome in the healthy colon, mainly it is two phyla. Phyla, it is P-H-Y-L-E. It is a plural of phylum. P-H-Y-L-U-M. This is a taxonomical classification of bacteria, which means simply ranking. There are seven types of these ranks. We start with the kingdom. And to remember, the kingdom is first. Remember, the king is always at the top. Then phyla. Phyla mean division, tribe, group, race. And the phyla, so it is below the kingdom and above the class. And the class above order. So, to remember, keep pan clean. Okay? Kingdom, pan, phylum, clean, class, or, order, family, F, get, G, genus, sick, species. So, the king at the top of phyla, Phyla at the top of a class. Class has order. Produce family. The family has a genus. And the genus produces species. This is to remember. Make it simple. So in our healthy colon, we have two groups of phyla. Thermicutes, which are Latin firm mean strong. Cutis mean skin. So these bacteria, they have strong skin, meaning they have strong cell membrane. They are mostly gram-positive bacteria and they consist of many classes and species. Bacteroidides with B capital letter, it is a plural of bacteriotides, small b. Small b, bacteriotides mean single bacteriotides, single bacterium. But this phyla, it is rod-like organisms, and these phyla, they like to live in anaerobic conditions. N mean no, aerobic mean no oxygen. And that is why so many bacteria are in the colon, because in the colon there is less oxygen, and the colon is also hot, And there is plenty of time for the food to stay inside the colon to be fermented for about one day, 24 hours. In the small intestine, the food will stay six hours. So there is not much chance for the microorganism to live in the small intestine if the small intestine is healthy. But in diseases, we could have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which is called SIBO. Or we could have SIFO, 
meaning small intestinal fungal overgrowth. In the stomach, we have very little microorganisms because of the acidity of the gastric juice, but still, there are microorganisms which could survive even in this highly acidic medium. For example, we talk about H. pylori. In the mouth, the microbiome is about 20 gram, and there is a biofilm on the teeth. It's called the plaque. And that's why you go to the dentist every six months to clean the plaque. The plaque are biofilm. What is biofilm? Biofilm is communities of bacteria producing exopolysaccharide, meaning they produce to the outside to make a matrix to protect themselves, like scaffolding. And this group of bacteria, they live together as communities inside this biofilm. To communicate between each other, they produce metabolite and to evade, to hide away from the immune system. And biofilm, it is found everywhere in nature, on water, on metals, everywhere. And sometimes we can have biofilm in the colon if there is dysbiosis or imbalance of the microbiome. The microbiome, always it is in balance. And the body, the intestinal wall, the lining of the intestinal wall, which is single cells, but they are specialized cells, they are all with the goal to protect the body from invading bacteria, viruses, toxin, the food we eat, even from the microbiome. So the microbiome always kept in the lumen of the gut. But some of it, it might go through the superficial layer of the mucus. The mucin is a gel-like material, like a layer in front of the intestinal epithelium. And it consists of a sticky gel, very complicated chemically, to consist of two layers. The inner layer adhere to the intestinal epithelium, and it is almost sterile. It does not allow any bacteria or toxin to pass through. But the superficial part of the mucil layer it is more fluidy and might get some bacteria inside it. The intestinal epithelium are shoulder to shoulder. They are tightly closed. There is tight junction in between them. And there are 40 proteins to make this tight junction. But the most important ones are four. And in diseases, to make this tight junction loose, there is a protein which is called zonulin. It makes this happen. But we could discover in the future many other keys to open this tight junction. And this is just the beginning. Zonulin was discovered in 2000. And the gene which carry this or make this protein is discovered in 2013 and it is the chromosome 16. 
It is very small chromosome and consists only of 3% of a human genome. So, and this chromosome 16, it is for zonulin production, but also for many autoimmune diseases like diabetes type 2, multiple sclerosis, diabetes type 1, celiac disease, so many diseases on this small chromosome 16. The microbiome, it is not who are they, what type, which matter. What matter is what they produce, what is their action, their function. This is very, very important. Why all the time <clears throat> we were ignorant about the microbiome. Why? Because we did not have the tools to examine the stool and find out more. We used to use a technology which is called culture medium. We culture this bacteria and from the stool on culture, which is artificial environment. And these bacteria, when you take them, out of their normal environment, the function is different. It's a completely different story. So we have to examine them in their environment. So now we start to discover more and more, and we are just in the infancy and in the beginning of the science. We are starting to use the DNA sequencing of these microorganisms. First, we start to use 16S, small r RNA, meaning 16S, R for ribosome, RNA. This gene, or part of a gene, it's found in 30S unit of the ribosome. This is, consists of two units. One is 50S and one is 30S. But 16S, it is found in 30S unit of the ribosome because the ribosome, it consists of two units. And this part of the gene, it is conserved during all years of the evolution and it is the same in all bacteria. So it is very useful to diagnose this microorganism because it is the same gene in all bacteria. There are segments in this gene which are conserved, but in between there is an area which is called hypervariable. So when we study it, we could see that this is a bacteria or microorganism, but also at the same time, we could differentiate between the types because of this hypervariable region. But now we use metagenomic. Meta mean after the genomic, meta. We examine all the genome of the bacteria. And in all the sample, and this gives us a great information. Imagine, if I examine your fingerprint, I will get some information about you. And this is 16 srna But imagine, if I sequence all your genome, then I will have more information about you. So this is now we have more tools to examine the samples and to examine the genome of these microorganisms. And there is now belomic, meaning what they are produced, or meta 
Belomic, meaning metabolism. The product which this microorganism produce. And this is the fascinating thing in health, in diseases, in our understanding, how they modulate the immune system, the nervous system, the gut health. It is very important. It depends on this microorganism. Because what we find that this microorganism produce short-chain fatty acid, which are called acetate, butyrate, and propionate. But mostly the, buter the butyrate because it is the fuel. It is the energy used by the colonocyte. Colonocyte, colon mean colon, large intestine. Site mean the cell of the colon. So, so butyrate, also we find that they produce vitamin K2, vitamin K, hormones, neurotransmitters. antibacterials and they are always this social the microorganisms are social they communicate between each other by small molecules so microbiome it is set from the beginning of our life and it reached the adult stage at three years old, but they can change with life and with the lifestyle we live, with the diet. In fact, they find that in a few days we could change the microorganisms in our gut if we live a healthy lifestyle. So. In being healthy, we have to look after our microbiome. And in inflammatory bowel disease, which I'm going to talk later on about, it is, they found that there is dysbiosis in the microbiome and there is no balance between the good microbiome or the microorganism and the pathogenic. And they find that one of the theories is hydrogen sulfide gas. If it is too much, it is toxic to the mitochondria. Hydrogen sulfide, it is very important chemicals for our physiology it is important for our nervous system, for our respiratory system, for our cardiovascular system, for our intestinal and digestive health. In fact, hydrogen sulfide, it is a vasodilator of the small blood vessels or the capillaries. We said before in other video that nitric oxide and O is vasodilator of a blood vessel, but nitric oxide is a vasodilator of large blood vessels, but hydrogen sulfide is vasodilator of capillaries of a small blood vessel. And this is very important theory in the causation of inflammatory bowel disease. Because only two amino acids, they contain sulfur, which is methionine and cysteine. And cysteine, cyst, C-Y-S-T, E, I, and E. Remember the E after the T. This is very important. This is a non-essential amino acid, meaning you don't need to eat it. It is not essential that you take it in your food. The body can make it. And it is the only amino acid in the body which produces protein. 
And this is very, very important point. Why? Because it is the only immune system, it is the only, sorry, amino acid which can combine with another cysteine, C-Y-S-T-E-I-N-E, -E, to produce disulfide bond. And then when it is two units, then it is called cysteine also, but the spelling is C-Y-S-T-I-N-E. The E after the T is gone. Because now, this cysteine, it is semi-amino acid. It is not a true amino acid. It enters into a chemical reaction. This disulfide bond is very, very important to keep the protein in shape, in folding, in different structure. Because all our body function is a protein. And how this protein produces different functions? because of a different shape, if you study them, three-dimensional shapes. And the sulfur, it's very important because it is in the same place as oxygen on the periodic table. And this cysteine is very important in producing antioxidant, you know, in stress, oxidative reactions, it produces glutathione. It is very, very important for our health. It is very important for mitochondrial function. But if it is outside in the lumen, as in IBD, which is inflammatory bowel disease, it is called disseminatory or disseminating, meaning spreading, meaning too much, meaning it is toxic now. In biology, there is balance. Always balance is good. Extreme is not good. Of course, in biology also there is no rule. And the only rule is there is no rule. And in biology, everything change. Everything change. It is dynamic. So IBD, it is a dynamic disease. It change over time. So this, you see, we have bacteria which produce hydrogen sulfide. There is bacteria which degrade hydrogen sulfide. But the balance in between the two is disturbed. So we have too much hydrogen sulfide in the gut. And this will produce toxicity to the mitochondria. And the mitochondria is very essential for the function of each cell, because it is the battery in every cell. It is the organism or the small organ which produces the energy in every cell. So, if there is no energy, the cell cannot do any function. The cell dies. And if the cell dies, there is uh, immune reaction. There is inflammatory reaction. So, this is one of the theories of inflammatory bowel disease and the microbiome. The other theory is that the barrier cover of the intestinal wall, it is thinner, it is degraded. And how do they know? Because they brought mucin and then they brought feces from patients with ulcerative colitis and put it with the mucin and the mucin start to be degraded. This is because if the mucin is thin, then the barrier of the intestine will be invaded by the microorganism. And then inflammation starts and the disease starts. Also, in this patient with inflammatory bowel disease, there is microorganism which is called Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Pseudo means false. Monas mean unit. Aeruginosa mean a green purple pus. These organisms usually they produce pus with pigment. 
pseudomonas, and they are toxic. And they play a part in the pathogenesis of inflammatory bowel disease. There are enzymes which help in balancing the hydrogen sulfides. But this Pseudomonas aeruginosa bacteria, they destroy these enzymes. So hence, the hydrogen sulfide H2S, it's more. So this is how the microbiome is involved in the pathogenesis of IBD. Also, there are studies which shows how the environment affects the microbiome. There is a study in the United States, an area which they said they have 50 cases of ulcerative colitis out of a 350. So a group of doctors and scientists, they went there. They could verify only 17 patients with ulcerative colitis out of a 350. And they find there is smelter near this area. Smelter means a factory which take the metal out of the ore. The ore is a mineral heated to produce the metal. And the metal is very valuable and expensive. For example, zinc, iron. These smelters, they produce fume and gases like mercury, lead, arsenic. So the people around this area, it is about 10 to 15 miles away. The people in this area have more IBD. But now a study started to detect how many children will be having IBD. They start to study this. So the microbiome, it is now, we start to know more about it. It is involved in inflammatory bowel disease. And this inflammatory bowel disease, it is not only local in the gut, which causes inflammation of the chronic inflammation of the gut, but this fire, in fact, in Greek and Latin, inflammation means set on fire with passion. But here there is no passion. It is setting a fire. It is like a fire, and this will go inside the body, and it will affect the metabolites from the microbiome and affecting the local immunity of the intestinal wall. And this will go in the body. It will affect the skin, which shows pyoderma gangrenosa, meaning pyo mean pus, derma mean skin. Gangrenosa means gangrene, and it looks uh, black or purple, blue in color or black, and there is ulceration and there is dead cells. And ulcer means discontinuity of the skin. There will be cavity or like a socket in the skin. Also, there is rash. There is erythema uh, nodosa. Erythema means red. Nodosa mean like nodules, like small tumors or small, yeah. Um, in the eye, it will produce conjunctivitis. Conjunctiva, itis mean inflammation of the conjunctiva. What is conjunctiva? Conjunctiva is the lining of the eyelids and the front of the eyeball. And this epithelium, 
is uncaratinized, stratified, sugwamous epithelium. Forget all these fancy names. Remember only N keratinized. N mean U N. Not keratinized. Mean not horny. Mean not dead. It is alive. Epithelial cells. Hence, microorganisms, viruses like the conjunctiva. Hence, in COVID-19, don't touch your eyes. Although this is not related to the microbiome and inflammatory bowel disease, but it is the same story. You see, the skin, the layer in the skin, it is keratinized, stratified, sigmoid epithelium. Keratinized in the skin mean dead cell, mean horny cell, keratin. And these are the dead cells which we shed from our skin. So, if the skin is intact and there is no abrasion or wound or a hole, then no microorganism can pass it through, especially the virus. Because the virus like a life host cells, does not like dead cells, because the virus want to attach to a healthy, living epithelial cells or host cells, and then use the machinery of that cells to produce viral particles. So this is good now to remember to keep your skin clean and not injured. Now, we come back to inflammatory bowel disease and the eye. The eye main job is to keep the eye clean. And the microbioma in the eye is very little at all times because there is a lot of complicated defense mechanism in the eye, antimicrobials, peptides, a lot of chemicals to protect the eye. It is very complicated. And especially the tear film. The tear film, it consists of three layers. The basal layer, which is stuck on the surface of the eye, is called, it is the basal layer. It is mucin produced by goblet cells in the eye. Goblet cell is the same like the cell in the intestinal wall to produce mucin. And this mucin is barrier against invader, against microorganisms. The second layer of the tear film is the aqueous layer, which is produced by the tear gland called lacrimal glands. It consists of water and salts, electrolytes, and there are 60 chemicals in this layer. And the third layer is the lipid layer of the tear film. And this lipid is produced by a gland called meibomian gland. And the lipid function is to protect the watery layer, which is the middle layer, from evaporation and to keep the watery layer like a box to prevent it from spilling to the outside. All these things are going in the eye to protect the eye from infection. And of course the tear is produced by the tear gland, which are called the lacrimal glands. There is one lacrimal gland on each side, and this lacrimal gland is about two centimeter in length. They are situated in the orbit above the eye, on the outer lateral side of the eye, and the secretion of the tear will come through the lacrimal duct, and there is lacrimal apparatus, meaning how the tear coming through this duct to the nasal cavity, so that when we are in tear, the, the, the tear coming even through our nose and then on our face, on our cheeks. 
Also, there are accessory glands which produce tear also and produce a new scene. And these are called Kraus, this is German, Wolfring, this is Polish, and another Italian. There are many accessory glands also to produce tear. The iris in inflammatory bowel disease will get involved. And what is the iris? It is the colored part of the eye. Inside it is the pupil, which dilate and constrict with the light, and the, around it is the iris, is the color. An iris in a Greek myth, it is a rainbow, it is multicolor. And there was a goddess which is called uh, Rainbow Goddess. She used to ride the road of rainbow and bring messages from Zeus, who is the king of gods, or they call him the father of gods, and from his wife Hera, H-E-R-A. And uh, he, he, he has many children from Hera, but he's called the father of gods because he has many women, many mistresses, and many divine children, like uh, um, Hercules, Helen of Troy, uh, Athena, Artemis. This is in Greek, but in uh, Roman, it is called Diana, the goddess of hunting the goddess of wild animals, then became the goddess of moon and chastity, Dionysus. So this Zeus, he has many children. And so this uh, goddess of rainbow, she used to ride the road of the rainbow, which is multicolor arc, and bring messages from heaven to earth. And this is the iris. The name in Greek is rainbow. It is the color part of the eye. And it gets inflamed in inflammatory bowel disease. Also, the uvea. It's called uveitis. These parts are in the middle part of the eye. So, we talk about the skin, about the eye. It, the, the joints are affected, so the patient will have arthritis. The bone are affected, so the bone will become osteoporosis, mean thin and uh, weak and empty, and there is more fractures in cases of inflammatory bowel disease, and also osteopenia, mean the mass of the bone become less. The liver is affected in ulcerative colitis. It is called a primary sclerosing cholangitis. Primary mean first time, and we don't know the cause. Sclerosing mean fibrosis. Cholangitis, itis mean inflammation. Cholangitis mean inflammation of the bile duct of the liver. The bile duct are the duct inside the liver which correct the bile secreted by the liver cells. So, this lead to liver failure, and then the patient will need liver transplant. This is the complication of inflammatory bowel disease inside the body. And if we treat IBD, you will see the arthritis will be, will be cured, will be gone, even if the patient have it for many years. So the disease, it doesn't confine to the gut. It goes through to the body, and it's called the systemic presentation of IBD. And also because the lining of the gut becomes sick and there is no absorption of iron, the patient will have anemia, which is called iron deficiency anemia, and also because this patient, they will have diarrhea bleeding per rectum and they will have vitamin b12 deficiency and this will lead to vitamin b12 deficiency anemia which is called pernicious anemia very serious anemia so the microbioma 
it is very important in modulating our immune system. And there are experiments which shows some microorganism they will affect the immune system. They will affect the T lymphocyte, which is a regulatory lymphocyte. They are just like the break on inflammation. We speak about inflammation. What is inflammation? Inflammation means if I bring you to my hands and do injury, it's the same, and bacteria and viruses will go in the wound, then there is inflammation, meaning it is the body response to cellular injury. And how it will respond? The cell in the area which are part of the inner part of the immune system, the immune system is two parts. The inner part, I-N-N-A-T-E, is the part which we are born with. It is there, which consists of the barriers. As we spoke, the barrier of the skin, the barrier in the gut, the barrier in the, uh, in the respiratory tract. We have to speak a video only on the immune system because the defense mechanism, it is a physical barrier, it is chemical, for example, acid in the stomach, it is mechanical, for example, sneezing, cough in the respiratory system, it is mechanical because of the cilia in the mucosa of the respiratory system and in the gut also. And especially in the respiratory system, they will move mechanically the foreign body out. out. The mucus is part of the immune system. So the inflammation now, these cells, they will send chemicals, messages, chemical messages, which is called interleukin before, meaning inter mean between, leukin between two, white blood cells. Hence, we have interleukin 1, 2, 3. We have interleukin from 1 till 35. They are all numbered. And each interleukin will have a specific function. Imagine. But now, they change the name from interleukin into cytokine. Why? Cyto means cell. Kin means it go to the tissue. So this chemical, the messages, They don't go between one white blood cell and another white blood cell. No, they go from white blood cell or a cell to the tissue. It is more area they influence. So the cytokine, there are messages, text like iPhone or email, they send to the blood vessels. The blood vessels respond because it has a receptor on the wall. The blood vessel will become dilated and then bring the blood to the area. And you bring with the blood its, its cell. You see, there are cells inside the blood, white blood cells, lymphocytes, uh, protein, fluid, and the protein like antibodies, which are part of the adaptive part of the immune system. There are small muscles. So the area of the inflammation is characterized by principal feature, which are redness called in Latin robor, swelling or congestion because the fluid comes from the blood vessel. It is called the tumor. The area become hot because the blood is hot. So it is called calor. And the area become painful. It is called dolor. And there is a fifth one which is loss of function, and in Greek it is called functio, F-U-N-C-T-I-O, lassi. Lassia mean loss of function. The first four cardinal sign, foundational sign, they were discovered 30 B.C. to 45 A.D. in that area, before about 2,000 years. But the loss of function by 
Verho, Verho, V-I-R-C-H-O, it is in the 19th century. This is a new one, the loss of function. And this is just a nutshell about the inflammation. So if we look to an inflamed epithelium of the large intestine, it will be red, swollen, just like angry, just like on fire. So the microbiome, it is essential for our immune system, it is essential for our nervous system, it is essential to modulate and train the immune system to not develop allergic reactions or asthma because it teach the immune system the tolerance. Tolerance, meaning the immune system has to learn to accept these microorganisms because it is a challenge, really. In the gut, these microorganisms living in the gut, they are foreign, but the body has to accept them. They can't do war with all these microorganisms. And also, at the same time, the body and the immune system has to differentiate between the good commensal microorganism and the pathogenic. And hence, the immune system, it is very, very sophisticated. If the, you study the immune system, especially, for example, in the intestine, in the intestinal wall, you will see that the cells can produce antibodies. Between the cell, there is just like telescope coming through the cell inside the lumen to see, to check if there is any uh, toxin, if there is any bacteria, if there is any virus. Then it will give message to the cell behind the mucosa. So look, there is somebody there. It is foreign. So this one, it is just like uh, guards, spies, to see which is pathogenic, which is toxic, which is bad. And then the body will start, it has so many defense mechanisms to protect itself and to keep itself healthy at all times. But sometimes when we don't look after ourselves, especially nowadays, if it is unhealthy lifestyle, then we have problems. And the most important factor in the environment which will affect our health is the food we eat and what nutrient we take and what are the component of the food which will affect the genomic or the genome of the microbiome because the food is information to the gene of the microbiome. So, for example, the food which trigger diseases and inflammation are the sugar, gluten, lactose, which is in the cow milk, uh, additives, emulsifiers. They find they are toxic to the microbiomes. Thickeners, like Xanthin gum, carnagen, which is used thickener. Some of it is in almond milk, which is in packet in the supermarket. Um, carnagen, emulsifier, artificial sweeteners. All these components of the food can affect the health of the microbiome and our health. You see, high-fat diet, because there is a study in India, they didn't have IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, but they went to study them. Now they have. They find these people, they don't eat uh, Western diet, but they eat their own food, but the way they cook it has changed. 
and perhaps perhaps because now they use vegetable oils which is rich in omega-6 omega-6 is inflammatory omega-3 is anti-inflammatory so the ratio of omega-3 to omega-6 should be one to one one omega-3 one omega-6 it is okay one omega-3 two omega-6 but nowadays if you examine the blood you will find omega-3 1 and omega-6 16 or 20 and these vegetable oils which you find cheap in the shelves of the supermarket in plastic bottles or even in glass bottles they are processed they are exposed to heat the chemical are added to them chemical are added to them to make them testy chemical added to them to make them better to make them better but from health point of view they are toxic so one should go as close to nature as possible and to get whole plant diet now about the microbes to recap i just want to say that the bacteria and the microbes are in us and a good example is the mitochondria which is the battery in every cell it to produce the chemical energy which we use in every action which is called ATP adenosine triphosphate and the origin of this mitochondria is a wild bacteria which is called alpha or proteobacteria proteo in Greek uh, myth it is god proteus mean the god of form it changed its form because these bacteria they are in a different forms and they are about 40 percent of the prokaryocytes pro mean primary karyocyte they are simple cell they have membrane but the nucleus or the genetic material have no membrane not like our cell our cell are complicated cell they are called eukaryocyte e u karyocyte k a r o site c y s t the our cell is more complicated why because we have cell membrane in each cell there is cell membrane the nucleus it has membrane nuclear membrane and it has many organelles organelles mean small organs to do the function it has the mitochondria the ribosome golgi apparatus so many small things there and mitochondria we have many mitochondria hundreds in every cells and the number it depend on the function of the cell for example the liver cell contain 2000 mitochondria the heart cells they have very high number of mitochondria the neuron the brain it contain many mitochondria and this how do we know it is because it is a uh, bacteria because the genome of the mitochondria is round it is different from the genome in the nucleus of every cell and it always come from the maternal side from the mother and it is similar to the genome of the wild bacteria alpha proteo bacteria and this is how we know and the genome of the mitochondria immigrate a little bit and mixed with the genome of us of our human nucleus you know it mixed with our uh, and this is called horizontal gene transfer or lateral gene transfer and that is how the mitochondria and the genome inside the nucleus communicate between them okay the human genome it contain 8.3 percent viral genome and these viruses are retroviruses which we got from our ancestors who were infected with the retroviruses 8.3 percent and it is called transposon 
and they are referred to retro, a trans boson. So it is R, T, retro, R, trans, T, P, as a shortage or as an acronym. And this retrovirus, which is in our genome, it is tamed. Now it is friendly with our genome. And it is very important because these retroviruses produce a protein which is called syncytin. It makes the protein connect to each other. And this protein, it is very important in the development of the placenta, the placenta inside the uterus, which through which the nutrition comes from the mother to the fetus in utero. So without the retrovirus, we could not have a placenta. See how they are important and how we coexist with these microorganisms. Also, they find that the viral genome inside the genome of cancer cells. There are about 10 to 15 cancer diseases. There are viruses inside the genomes. 90% is the viral genome. And these cancers, they start as an infection. For example, hepatitis B virus. Hepatitis C. Of course, hepatitis B is transmitted by sex and by saliva and by blood. And hepatitis C by blood, which is most common in Egypt. And it was common because they used the same needles for many patients when they used to treat schistomyosis. So they infect their people because they didn't know at that time. And herpes virus. And in healthy cells, they find bacterial proteins, many types, sometimes 23 proteins, sometimes 200 proteins. And they find the bacterial genome in 20% of the healthy human cells. So, I recap that microbiome is a new frontier in science and in human understanding of diseases and health. And it is thinking out of the box. The scientist knows, the microbiologist knows about these things, and the people who have time to read and study the new information. But unfortunately, the people who are very busy and they don't have time, they don't know about the microbiome. Even they are working in healthcare. They have no idea that there is a new subject, which is called the microbiome. And I asked many of my friends, they don't, because they are too busy. They are good. Doesn't mean they are bad, but there is no time to study. And the information are so fast. And this is only in the infancy of human knowledge.